Welcome to this lecture from History of Christian Worship Practices. My name is John Chilko, Worship Professor at Nebraska Christian College. Today will be a brief overview of baptism in the church from the Old Testament to today. Baptism is the accepted sign or symbol that designated the new believer as a full Christian and part of the church. This is the initiation unto Christianity, and it has been so since the first century. Baptism is a symbolic act of initiation, but for Jews, that in act of initiation was circumcision. So baptism was practiced as a sign of repentance, ceremonial cleansing, and conversion. As we see John the Baptist baptizing for the repentance of their sins, um, he actually baptized Jesus as well, as we see in Matthew 5. But Jesus baptized for salvation and to, to receive the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Matthew 28, 19 says from Jesus, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we see in uh, the letters from Paul, Christians were baptized into Christ, united in faith with all believers. So these two statements actually probably have a bit of church teaching and theology written into them from the, uh, the author of those books. So initially, baptism was only in the name of Jesus, baptized in the name of Jesus. We see that people were baptizing in the name of John and others were baptizing in the name of Jesus. But this Trinitarian baptism of baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit was established within the first hundred years of Christianity. So it's more than likely that this statement was actually given to Jesus, but with some Trinitarian instruction or theology in it. Also, baptized into Christ, united in faith with all believers, is a bit of a statement of faith, uh, like a mini creed, if you will, some theology about baptism. It's the initiation into Christ, into Christianity, united in faith with all believers. In the early second century, we see an established practice recorded in the Didache. So we understand that churches were starting to have a formulized plan of how to baptize people and why to baptize new converts. So as Christianity moved outside of um, Palestine and the area around Jerusalem, churches needed to have a teaching and an understanding of what baptism truly meant. As we move into the third century, infant baptism starts to be uh, more and more prevalent. However, it's also um, a bit of tension between early church teachers. Tertullian argued against it, saying that this was not a believer's baptism and they could not confess and they could not understand salvation. So infants shouldn't be baptized. But we see in Acts 16, the jailer in Philippi, he and his entire household were baptized, and many came to believe that that meant incl included children and infants. So uh, infants were baptized often. However, at this time, most converts were still adults, and so there's extensive training and preparation as they moved out of their culture and their other religious practices into Christianity. They had to be taught what to believe and why Christianity was different. And so there were months, even up to two years of training for these, uh, these initiates. And then baptism usually happened in the early church on Easter Sunday. It was preceded by an all-night vigil on Saturday. And then there would be many scriptures read for this special baptism service. The initiates would be anointed with oil all over the entire body. And then they would be brought into the water, and when they came out, they would recite what we now know as the Apostles' Creed, or a strong statement of faith, as they were initiated into Christianity. Following their baptism, they finally were allowed to have their first communion, being united with the body of Christ. As we move to the Middle Ages, this long period of time 
really transitioned into infant baptism being the primary um, experience for Christians. This was probably, for the most part, because the Roman Empire itself was a Christian empire at this time. And so you were born into the faith, and you never left the faith, and the only converts would be um, those that would be conquered by the empire and brought into the Roman Empire. And once you were brought into the empire, then you were expected to convert to Christianity. So babies were born into a Christian family, um, and there were or no adult converts. And it also became a private family event then because these babies would be baptized uh, around the eighth day after they were born. Because the converts were infants, they had to change the training time and the teaching of what it meant to be a Christian. So young children would go through a confirmation or catechism classes. Drury explains it this way. By the end of the Middle Ages, Christian culture predominated. Almost all new converts or babies were baptized in private ceremonies soon after birth. Confirmed by bishops at about seven years of age and eventually 12, they became full participants as adults in communion. So we look at baptism in the Reformation. Martin Luther had two initial reforms. He brought baptism ceremony back to the local church. Instead of having baptisms happen in the home, this was a sacrament, a holy moment, and it should be done in the church. And it was also done in the local language so that the church and the family could experience that sacrament together. It was not done in Latin. It was not done as just some ritual, but it was done something for the family, for the local congregation. There are many variations of theological and mystical understanding, symbolism, and ceremony, depending on the Reformation and the Reformers and the traditions that they developed in their understanding of what baptism was. Some believe that Christ was present in the spiritual sense, some believe that Christ was there um, in, a, in the spiritual realm. Others believe this was a completely symbolic act of faith. And some saw the ceremony as uh, more uh, ritualistic than necessary. Some completely eliminated the ritual altogether. So we see Anglicans, Reformed theologians, Methodists, and Lutherans continuing with infant baptism. They understood, some understood the covenant theology of original sin and original grace. So as you are born, you are born with original sin as soon as you take your first breath. And therefore, you need to be covered by the grace of God. And this is not necessarily um, salvation, but this is God saying, you have been covered by my grace and I, am, I have died for your sins, whether you have accepted it personally or not. Most of these with infant baptism then would have con uh, confirmation afterwards. Anabaptists introduced this radical new idea of adult baptism, where, no, you needed to be baptized as an adult, and if you had not been baptized as an adult, your infant baptism did not count. So you needed to be baptized, once again, as a believer, as an expression of coming to faith. However, they didn't do full immersion. They poured three times over the head, um, and we see this continued in the Mennonite tradition and other brethren traditions today where there's pouring in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. English Baptists did insist on full immersion as they were going back to Scripture and going back to the ancient tradition of the first few centuries of Christianity. And we see Quakers eliminating the baptism sacrament uh, altogether, at least in a physical ceremony. They saw the sacrament as something that the Holy Spirit did, and it was symbolic and personal and internal. You did not ex uh, express any um, ritual or symbolic act ahead out loud in the congregation. Baptism and confirmation had always reflected two ends of one continuum. Grace, the reflecting on what God has done, and knowledge, reflecting personal beliefs. The Reformation was not about ending infant baptism and introducing a personal conversion along with adult baptism. Again, if you look at this, this spectrum, this continuum of grace and knowledge, 
that is a great uh, way to understand why there are so many variations of baptism, but why baptism continues to be used as the initiation process into faith. Whether you're baptized as an infant, some believe we can understand the knowledge and personal beliefs later, or you come to a saving knowledge of Christ and then you are baptized as a response or as the ultimate final step of salvation. Anywhere in between this huge spectrum, we still see baptism as an important con uh, component, an essential component to being a part of the church. As we look at baptism in the 20th and 21st century, the modern era, we see uh, a few different things happen. First of all, in the camp meetings and revivalism, we see the altar call being developed. We see this whole movement where the revivalists were calling people to come to Christ, to come down, to make a decision, to follow Jesus. And it was an emotional decision. It was... Uh, a mindful decision, but it was a decision that they made. And as soon as they made that decision, they were part of Christianity. They were came to the faith and baptism, therefore, began to be minimized as these uh, camp meetings and revivals started to change the process, so to speak. They diminished the importance of baptism. So we'd have a believer's prayer with an altar call and a conversion experience. And that alone was what needed to be, you needed to come to faith. However, there's still quite a few baptisms happened. Um, baptisms would often happen in rivers or baptisms would happen um, in lakes, um, natural bodies of water on the f frontier. But it was not essential for salvation for converts. You were converted just by praying and stating that you believed in Jesus. So we see many mainline denominations, again, like Methodists, Presbyterians, which were from the Reformed movements, Lutherans, Episcopalians, etc. They practiced infant baptism as a sign of blessing and inclusion into the faith heritage of a family and as a statement of dedication by the family to raise the child in the church. This infant baptism idea, again, covered the original sin and the grace of God was on that child uh, from baptism all the way through their life. So this usually followed by confirmation around the age 12. Communion may or may not be allowed before confirmation, depending on the denomination. We also see adult or believer baptism. Baptists, restoration movements, Pentecostals, non-denominational churches. Some have a statement of faith. Symbolizing the spiritual transformation already occur occurred during salvation. So baptism is just an outward expression of an inward transformation. Others, however, see baptism as the final act of salvation or the acceptance where they receive the Holy Spirit. Again, quite a few variations with baptism, but it all is about being initiated into the believer's. So as we finish this lecture, I just want you to think about the ritual of baptism. It is one of the few things that we do in Christianity that has symbolism that reaches all the way back to ancient times. And depending on your belief, your heritage, what you've been taught, there's different theologies around baptism. There's different understandings of what happens during baptism. If baptism is a human choice and a human expression or if it is God moving uh, through the belief and the obedience of the believer if God intersects with them uh, and, a Holy S and the Holy Spirit comes upon them during baptism if they are in then indwelt by the Holy Spirit if salvation is finally completed in this process or if it has already already happened and um, the baptism itself is just uh, an expression for the congregation to accept that as a new believer. There are many different variations of baptism, but the ultimate understanding is if you become one with Christ, you are baptized into the faith and into the community 
of believers of Christ.